Hello everyone. Today we're going to continue with Fool Me Twice, Fighting the Assault on Science in America, Chapter 7, American Anti-Science. This is a fairly long chapter, it's 32 pages, so I'll probably end up having to film it over two days, so I apologize if my outfit randomly changes halfway through. So we'll begin with a quote. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. It is so easy to be immature. If I have a book to serve as my understanding, a pastor to serve as my conscience, a physician to determine my diet for me, and so on, I need not exert myself at all. I need not think, if only I can pay, others will readily undertake the irksome work for me. Immanuel Kant, 1784. God help us. At the same time that the American science enterprise was turning away from the national dialogue, American religion was organizing. Unlike science, churches still depended on engaging the public for their financial support, and they were alarmed by the deep skepticism toward religion and religious authority that was being shown by many baby boomers and the broader public in the 1970s. The prevailing feeling was that science disasters and the bomb were rendering life increasingly hopeless, but organized religion seemed out of touch and unable to help parse the new moral and ethical challenges. With membership and collections failing, many emerging Protestant leaders believed the answer lay in reaching out in new ways. Suddenly evangelism was relevant again, and this time its leading figure was Billy Graham. Graham's overnight success had been two decades in the making. On September 25, 1949, just a month after the Soviet Union shook the world with its successful test of a nuclear bomb, the 30-year-old Baptist preacher from North Carolina by way of Minnesota stepped onto the stage inside a giant tent on Washington Boulevard at Hill Street in Los Angeles. He built it as the Greater Los Angeles Billy Graham Crusade at the Canvas Cathedral with the steeple of lights. Backed by hundreds of Christian leaders from across Southern California, Graham drew an average of 5,400 people every night, with thousands more standing out in the twilight, straining to hear or listening over their car radios. The spectacle went on for 65 sermons over eight weeks, drawing 350,000 people. Graham's evangelical sermons were the pitch-perfect blend of Northern progressivism and Southern conservatism that gave him a mainstream Billy Sunday-style brand that went over well in California and then across America. It was a formula that others would copy. Graham quoted scripture and railed against science as he talks about his experiences as a traveling preacher in the days after World War II. All across Europe, people know that time is running out, he told his worried audience. Now that Russia has the atomic bomb, the world is in an armament race driving us to destruction. The time to accept Jesus was now or never. First of all, I want you to see the need in the philosophical realm. We have just come through an era of materialism, an era of patronism and humanism in the educational circles of this country. We have been deifying man. We have been humanizing God. And all over the religious world, there is a stark unbelief in the supernatural. All through this country of ours, we have denied the supernatural, outlawed the supernatural, and said that miracles are not possible now. And we have taken up with things rather than the spirit of God. Because of the goodness and the grace of God, I can say tonight that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. There are tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trust in Jesus Christ as a savior? Tonight, I'm glad to tell you, as we close, that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received, your sins forgiven, your burdens lifted, your problems solved by turning your life over to him, repenting of your sins, and turning to Jesus Christ as Savior. Shall we pray? Graham was offering a message of hope and wonder in the face of fear. It was a message that for the prior 50 years had been offered by science. But now Graham was inviting people back into in the eyes of Immanuel Kant, the cowardice of lifelong immaturity. In his 1957 crusade, the year of Sputnik 1, Graham continued to use anxiety over the H-bomb to sound an anti-science theme, saying, When Sir Walter Raleigh had laid his head on the executioner's block, and the officer asked if his head lay right, Sir Walter Raleigh said, It matters little, my friend, how the head lies, provided the heart is right. The heart has come to stand for the center of the moral, intellectual, and spiritual life of a man. 
Scientists who would dismiss Graham's impact should take note that his work has reached an estimated 2.2 billion people, and according to Gallup polls, he has ranks among the 10 most admired men for half a century. They would do well to understand the chord Graham strikes, an intensely personal, emotional, and spiritual chord. The desire to create knowledge that motivates science ultimately shares some of the same drives as that of its progenitor, religion, to understand the mystery and wonder of the world and our place in it, to find meaning and hope, and to make life better. These are courageous aspirations in the face of fear, which scientists would do well to trumpet, along with science's track record of actually achieving them. The Civil War of Values by the 1970s, the evangelical movement Graham had played a large part in reviving had grown exponentially thanks to technology. Pioneering televangelists Oral Roberts, Robert Schuller, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, James Dobson, Tim and Tammy Faye Backer, and other leading televangelists produced gospel shows that together reached, according to Arbitron, more than 22 million viewers per week. The common and primary aim of these televangelists was conversion, as dictated by Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and Mark chapter 16, verse 16, New American Standard Bible. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. This demanded the delivery of constant, strident, emotional, and inspiring sales pitches to any and all who would listen, just the opposite of what was going on with science, which, as it enjoyed the fruits of Vannevar Bush's ability to secure government funding for the sciences, was cloistered in its own abbeys' laboratories. A logical outgrowth of making disciples of all the nations is to co-opt the political process, which is why evangelicals moved into the political sphere. Graham was a registered Democrat who publicly opposed intolerance and authoritarianism and said that religion should not choose political sides. But he became a minority as religion went political in a big way. Sarah Diamond, a sociologist who follows the growth of the Christian right, describes it in this way. It is a political movement rooted in rich evangelical subculture, one that offers participants both the means and the motivation to try and take dominion over secular society. The means include a phenomenal number of religious broadcast stations, publishing houses, churches, and grassroots lobbies. The motivation is to preach the gospel and to save souls, but also with equal urgency to remake our contemporary moral culture in the image of Christian scripture. On the front lines of our persisting battle over what kind of society we are, and will become the Christian right wages political conflicts not just through the ballot box, but also through the movement's very own cultural institutions. While the voice of science, the very root and foundation of secular democratic society, had gone silent, the voice of Protestantism had grown evangelical, wild, angry, fearful, militant, anti-science, and intensely political, engaging in a civil war of values, as James Dobson's Focus on the Family radio ministry put it, declaring that the 1990s would be the civil war decade, in effect a cultural revolution, with the goal of remaking America to conform to Christian scripture. Few scientists saw any connection to the absence of science from public debate. A survey of Science Magazine, the leading publication of the American Science Enterprise, shows no mention of the phrase religious rights until a November 1989 article about attempts to teach creationism in science classes, two months before Dobson's proclamation. Prior to the state, references were chiefly to fundamentalists, the dogged but easily dismissed foes of evolution whose periodic school board flare-ups had been chronicled in the magazine since the days of George McCready Price and William Jennings Bryan in the early 1920s. The fact that they had become a national political force and that the voice of science in the national dialogue was weakening appears, with few exceptions, to have been largely overlooked or ignored in the professional conversation among scientists. Dobson's point of view is a perfectly legitimate one, part of a strain of American thought going back to the Second Great Awakening in the early 19th century. But American democracy relies on a plurality of voices representing economic, scientific, and religious perspectives to arrive at balanced public policy. With the voice of science growing silence in our public and political dialogue, America no longer had that plurality. The country's policies and politics became increasingly unbalanced, and a generation grew up regarding science as increasingly irrelevant and shaped the public dialogue, even as it was impacting their lives more and more powerfully. 
As policy challenges came increasingly to revolve around science issues, their proposed solutions increasingly came to revolve around faith. Science class without objective truth. The 1960s and 70s were a time of momentous social change, particularly related to civil rights. For the first time, the United States was making a serious effort to educate African American children to the same standard as white students. Of the primary methods employed was school desegregation. This posed complex challenges for teachers who were tasked with educating more diverse classrooms as black students whose communities had been uprooted first by highway construction, then by busing, found themselves thrown into the mix with more advantaged white students. It seemed unrealistic to demand equal performance from students who did not have the same level of socioeconomic support or shared cultural references. Similar conclusions were coming from science educators involved in the efforts to transfer scientific knowledge and educational methods to developing countries. Why should we suppose that a program of instruction in Bosnia, say, which is well designed for British children familiar with an English countryside and English ways of thinking and writing will prove equally effective for boys and girls in a Malayan village, they asked. It is not merely that the plants and their ecology are different in Malaya, more important is the fact that the children and their ecology are also different. Beginning in the 1970s, science educators began to sense a growing awareness that for science education to be effective, it must take a much more explicit account of the cultural context of the society which provides its setting and whose needs it exists to serve. While white teachers once taught white students using white cultural references, now all teachers had to develop strategies to reach diverse classrooms. These new strategies were built on the assumptions of social constructivism, wherein learning is regarded as a social process. Educators have long viewed science as either a culture in its own right or as transcending culture. More recently, many educators have come to see science as one of several aspects of culture, wrote science education professor William Coburn, referring to the idea that science is the cultural expression of Western white men. But if that is true, isn't teaching science a form of cultural genocide? The only answer to this logical contradiction lay in redefining what we meant by truth. Social constructivist thinking became the mainstream paradigm in Western teacher education in the 1970s and 1980s, going on to influence the educations of tens of millions of American students. Parts of this transformation have been very positive for science, the emphasis on hands-on learning and on process over products. But constructivist thinking in education also came to hold the well-intentioned but incorrect belief that there is no representation of reality that is privileged or correct. One education professor describes it this way. Because reality is in part culture dependent, it changes over time as cultures do and varies from community to community. Knowledge is neither eternal nor universal. We must think increasingly in terms of teachers and students learning together rather than the one telling the other how to live in a top-down manner. This is necessary both so that the values and interests of students are taken into account, and so that the wealth of their everyday experience is made available to fellow students and to the teacher. This confusion of reality with culture devalues knowledge and presumes that students have some wealth of everyday experience that is of equal value to the lesson at hand, and the teacher does not have access to, despite extensive training. What could that be? The student's experience as a member of a political identity group, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, age, etc., that is different from the teachers? What does this teach the student? That there is no real knowledge out there that we all strive to attain. Instead, we each construct our own reality and the perspective already held is of equal value to anything to be learned. This emotional and political goal may make the student, thus the teacher, feel good, but science has proven through its profound fecundity that it is simply not true. Scientists argue that the purpose of education has shifted from teaching knowledge and skills to providing a learning environment in which students constructed their own knowledge. While inclusiveness is important in closing the education gap, it may be argued that high expectations are also important, and that overemphasizing political identity or culture undermines the knowledge teachers are trying to impart shortchanging students. There is a difference between being inclusive and elevating all ideas to the same level, and there is a difference between not forcing assimilation and cheating students of truth. Knowledge knows no color. It is of higher value because it is tied to physical reality. What defines it as knowledge is its separability from the individual. When it is not separable, it is opinion. This reasoning goes back to Locke and Bacon. The confusion this causes makes some scientists simply want to throw up their hands in despair. Consider the following introduction to a 1998 science education paper presented at a national conference. As Richard Dawkins likes to put it, there are no epistemological relativists at 30,000 feet. 
But today some will say not so fast. Dawkins offers a brute definition of universality completely devoid of any nuance of understanding and equally devoid of relevance to the question at hand. No one disputes that without an airplane of fairly conventional description, a person at 30,000 feet is in serious trouble. The question of universality does not arise over the phenomena of falling. The question of universality arises over the fashion of the propositions given to account for the phenomena of falling, the fashion of the discourse through which we communicate our thoughts about the phenomena, and the values we attach to the phenomena itself and the various ways we have of understanding and accounting for the phenomena, including the account offered by a standard scientific description. In today's schools, there are often competing accounts of natural phenomena, especially where schools are located in multicultural communities. There are also competing claims about what counts as science. The teaching that there is no objective reality, but rather many subjects of realities, or in this case, that the subjects of realities are on equal or par with the objects of reality, you're dead, in turn influences students' views of the primacy of knowledge. To critics, history is no longer the search for what really happened, but rather the victor's interpretation is seen through the lens of power and oppression, and it bears a cultural and political focus. Literature is no longer a study of what the author meant, but of the feelings it arouses in the reader because of his or her cultural perspective. Reading the classics is no longer required because they're sexist and racist and not germane to today's political realities. Truth must be evaluated in the context of the speaker's socioeconomic frame of reference, and teachers, when they lack the political authority of having the same cultural identity as their students, cannot presume to teach them, but can only be guides at the side. By the late 1980s, classics professor Alan Bloom lamented the effects of postmodernist education on the thinking of the students coming into his classroom at the University of Chicago. His concern spawned a nationwide discussion when he wrote about it in The Closing of the American Mind. The relativity of truth is not a theoretical insight, but a moral postulate, the condition of a free society, or so the students see it. They have all been equipped with this framework early on, and it is the modern replacement for the inalienable natural rights that used to be the traditional American grounds for a free society. That it is a moral issue for students is revealed by the character of their response when challenged, a combination of disbelief and indignation. Are you an absolutionist? The only alternative they know uttered in the same tone as, are you a monarchist, or do you really believe in witches? Absolutism is considered morally objectionable if it leads to intolerance, but that is only true when it is applied to a matter of faith or opinion, but not knowledge. In the case of science, precisely the opposite is proven to be true. By acknowledging there is an objective reality, we can form knowledge about that reality by using science and observation. We remove questions and facts from the authoritative arguments. This is the great insight that the United States was founded upon. The importance is in the knowledge, not the speaker, just the opposite of the postmodern perspective. Bloom was criticized as a conservative, a sexist, a racist, all of which he denied. Openness and the relativism that makes the only plausible stance in the face of various claims to truth and various ways of life and kinds of human beings is the great insight of our times. The true believer is the real danger. The study of history and of culture teaches that all the world was mad in the past, men always thought they were right, and that led to wars, persecution, slavery, xenophobia, racism, and chauvinism. The point is not to correct the mistakes and really be right, rather it is not to think you are right at all. The students, of course, cannot defend their opinion. It is something with which they have been indoctrinated. The best they can do is point out all the opinions and cultures there are and have been. What right, they ask, do I or anyone else have to say one is better than the others? If I pose the routine questions designed to confute them and make them think, such as, if you had been a British administrator in India, would you have let the natives under your governance burn the widow at the funeral of a man who had died? They either remain silent or reply that the British should never have been there in the first place. It is not that they know very much about other nations or about their own. The purpose of their education is not to make them scholars, but to provide them with a moral virtue, openness. Postmodern anti-science. While scientists were turning inward to their lab benches and the religious right was organizing, a new form of anti-science thinking arose on the secular left. It was a reaction against the ideas of rationalism that lay at the foundation of the Enlightenment and its attempt to bottom out arguments in the physical world as John Locke had counseled. The central idea of this postmodernist thinking was that both traditional religion and the Enlightenment had gotten it wrong, and there is no such thing as objective truth. Instead, these thinkers held, truth is subjective and to be found in the language, context, cultural identity, and personal perspective of the observer. A middle-aged African-American male will have a different experience and so a different truth than a young white American male, who will have a different truth than the older Hispanic American female. Their perspectives determine what is true for them, and anything they say on a given subject must be qualified by their political right to make those statements. 
Like fundamentalism, postmodernism began in the late 19th century and grew slowly at first, but then after World War II and the atomic bomb and during the civil rights movement, it expanded exponentially into what it is now. It goes by a number of other names as well, including social constructivism, multiculturalism, deconstructionism, poststructuralism, cultural and moral relativism. It would have an anti-science effects on American society as profound as the religious rights. The top-wing rationalist view of the world that the more extreme postmodernists object to can be summed up as follows. 1. There is a world. It is real. It is filled with objects and processes that exist independently of us and our beliefs about them. 2. The goal of science is to create descriptions of reality that are independent of us and our opinions or beliefs. We call these descriptions knowledge. 3. To create this knowledge, we use the scientific method, which is a collection of several techniques, including observation, hypothesizing, induction, experimentation, unique prediction, recording, and critical peer review. These techniques have evolved over time and will likely continue to evolve. 4. Like our senses, the scientific method is fallible and often leads us astray, but it is the best method we have come up with so far, and it has proven to be very powerful. The religious right took issue with these claims when they conflicted with dogma or a literal reading of the Bible. Postmodernists took issue with them on principle, arguing that they are suspects at the root because they are based on unexamined assumptions of the Western white male dominant culture that created modern science. Postmodernists also objected to the claims of absolute truth made by organized religion, which was also largely Western white male dominated. Postmodernism was thus a secular reevaluation of every claim of truth all of which were suspected of being linguistic means of domination. Truth was subjective. Over the course of 20 years, this thinking would come to influence all of American discourse, education, and politics, and become central to America's culture wars. Thus spake the anti-scientist. Postmodernism's roots ironically lie in the writings of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who famously proclaimed that God is dead and invented the idea of the ubermensch, or superman, and thus spake Zarathustra, in which he set humanity the goal of creating a super race. Out of you who have chosen yourselves shall a chosen people arrive, and out of it the superman. It was a concept that later would inform Nazism. Reacting against the Enlightenment and suffering from paranoia, Nietzsche questioned the very idea that there could be objective truth, arguing instead for something he called perspectivism, which held that truth is a matter of your perspective. Following Nietzsche, a number of German and French philosophers, among them Martin Heidegger, who became a Nazi in 1933, Michael Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Jacques Lacan, Julia Kristeva, and Bruno Latour, together with a few Americans including Richard Rorty and Paul Feyerabend, began rejecting the idea that reality and facts existed independently of our thinking about them. The intellectual descendants of Descartes, these philosophers pointed to examples from quantum mechanics, relativity, and cultural anthropology to illustrate their argument that truth was in the mind of the beholder. Cultural anthropology in particular became their tools. They subjected science to study as if it were a foreign culture, but the field was also justification for their arguments in that it seeks to shag cultural bias by observing indigenous cultures within their own frames of reference. Thus, we had anthropologist Carlos Castaneda taking peyote and writing about his mystical vision quests. Albert Einstein was showing us that our measurements were dependent on our frame of reference and special relativity. German physicist Max Planck was demonstrating how the observer affects the events being observed in quantum mechanics. By elevating subjectivity and reducing science's claims of objectivity to just one of many cultures, the troublesome implications of science, true or not, that our minds might simply be expressions of our anatomy, for example, or that the humanities had less to offer society's forward march than the sciences, were easily dispensed with, and suddenly everything seemed new and mysterious again. In the American humanities, and subsequently in American politics and education, this came to mean that all systems of thought had equal merit and only had to be internally consistent. They were all just different languages or constructs for assembling our experience of reality. Thus, postmodernists thought of themselves as tolerant and non-judgmental. 
In America, this thinking merged with new political ideas about affirmative action and became widespread. Postmodernism provided a secular, progressive, inclusive interpretation of reality for those who felt that there were many worthy groups like African Americans, women, Native Americans, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgendered persons, and others who had been disenfranchised by the Western white male dominant culture of which science was a powerful part. The postmodern view fit well with the growing ambivalence toward science after the bomb and during the Cold War. People reasoned that perhaps science didn't really provide an objective view of reality after all. Maybe it was just a bill of goods. Scientific truth had included a lot of oppressive tools and erroneous conclusions. The bomb, chemical pollution, eugenics, phrenology, and not to mention the exclusion of women and minorities from its ranks. The list of offenses seemed endless. Perhaps it really was simply the cultural expression of the privileged Western white male society from whence the Enlightenment sprang. Perhaps its so-called objectivity was really a smokescreen to hide its attempt to exploit and hang on to power. This view was enthusiastically embraced by the largely left-leaning academics in the humanities of many universities who found themselves being deposed by science in the battle of the two cultures. They found common cause with political activists representing feminism, environmentalism, African Americans, Native Americans, the working poor, humanism, the peace movement, gay rights, animal rights, anti-nuclear activists, and other disempowered groups. Science came to be seen as the province of hawkish, pro-business, political right power structure, polluting, uncaring, greedy, mechanistic, sexist, racist, imperialistic, oppressive, and not to be trusted. Cooneyism in 1962, this broad ambivalence toward science crystallized with the publication of American philosopher Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Stunningly, it became one of the most cited academic books of the 20th century. It sold about a million copies, a figure unheard of for a philosophical text, and gave clarity to Americans' increasingly ambivalent attitudes toward science and the nature of reality. Science was not the gradual and painstaking accumulation of knowledge, Kuhn said, but rather a sociological and thus political phenomenon that happens and sudden paradigm shifts. These shifts were akin to religious revelations or quantum leaps in the energy states of electrons, which accumulate energy and then leap to higher orbits in discrete, sudden jumps. The politics the book ascribed to the science resonated closely with prevailing attitudes. Scientists, the man, resist new baby boomer ideas, clinging to old Western white male outdated theories even as the evidence they are being willfully blind to accumulates discrimination like energy in an electron until it finally becomes overwhelming, the civil rights movement. Then suddenly, in a crystallizing moment, revelation, the ruling orders displace <laughs> comeuppance, and the intellectual understanding of the old bigoted paradigm attitude shifts to a new wider orbiting, more tolerance and inclusive paradigm that incorporates affirmative action, previously discounted outliers, disempowered groups. Kuhn was striving to describe science not as we think it is, but as it really is, and so was likely strongly influenced by its times. He pointed to several past scientific revolutions as examples, and argued that they had not been intellectual so much as sociological upheavals. As evidence, he quoted Max Planck, who along with Einstein founded the revolutionary field of quantum mechanics. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, Planck said, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. This speaks to the politics of science that is the subjects of this book, but it does not speak to the fundamental truth or falsity of a new theory itself. Kuhn's great error was to intertwine the politics of science and the discovery of truth and call them one. People of vested interest. Abandoning them to accept a newly or more completely revealed truth is done at some personal, emotional, and often financial and political cost, and that is hard. That is why the intellectual honesty demanded by science is both so brutal and so nourishing, so cherished and so beautiful. Thus, bad or even old science, science colored by what Bacon called the numberless ways, our assumptions, prejudices, political motivations, and affections, color our understanding, and science that is colored by the limitations of our senses or instruments is eventually replaced by good or more accurate science. Eugenics and phrenology are discredited, for example, but so is Newtonian physics. But it is usually only the progenitor of the previous paradigm that hangs on so dearly, not the entire scientific community, as Kuhn implied. If something new is found that better explains things, the scientific community is all over it because that's where the excitement and opportunity lie. Kuhn was writing as a social critic as much as a philosopher. Long Division 
Many of our ideas are revised upon closer observation, and it doesn't have anything to do with our political biases per se. It can simply be because we have finally developed the tools to make close enough observations. Locke said that sensory knowledge is the least reliable, and so it is. Refinements in our tools and observations allow us to see that things which once appeared real were misinterpretations based on limited observation. This process of refinement charts the history of science itself. Modern science began as natural philosophy, and then with Galileo's finer telescope, astronomy was carved out of that to become its own science, followed by Robert Boyle's 1661 masterpiece, The Skeptical Chemist, which separated chemistry, and then Newton's carving out of physics in 1687 with Principia Mathematica. After Darwin's 1859 publication on the origin of species, biology became firmly established as a separate field, and with the 1875 publication of William Lund's Principles of Physiological Psychology, we carved out psychology. In the 20th century, we finally separated neuroscience, the science of the nervous system and mind, the subjects from which much of natural philosophy originally sprang. Why so late? Because much of neuroscience became possible only with the development of electronics, computer technology, and the imaging systems required to study, measure, and stimulate brain function. These tools were then combined with new understandings of the interaction of software and hardware and the biology of how chemical and electrical signals give rise to one another. We are still asking the same questions we were in the days of natural philosophy, but now we can increasingly ask them in a scientific context. Concepts Collapse Neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland calls this process concept collapse. As an example, she offers impetus in physics and vitalism in biology. Impetus was thought of for centuries as an inner force that kept things moving, but then Newton revealed that to be an illusion. We had something that had seemed to be observable, and it all turned out not to be a real thing at all. It was similar with vitalism, the life force that was thought to distinguish living things from non-living things, what makes a rock different from a living being and a living body different from a dead one. In 1900, we used to think it was one thing, some vital force or spirit, says Churchland. In fact, we now know that it is many things, with the discoveries of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and the basic chemical building blocks of life, the understanding of the role of mitochondria, of ribosomes of cell biology, the chemical nature of DNA, the folding and unfolding of proteins, and so on. That concept, too, has been revealed as illusory about 80 years ago now. Another example is our age-old idea of fire. What is fire, really? It is the burning of wood. It's the fire of the sun. It's the fire of lightning. It's the magical fire in a firefly's tail. But when we apply closer observations, this one concept collapsed into four very different things, none of which had very much at all to do with any other. The burning of wood, we learned, is oxidation, much more akin to rusting than it is to the fission going on in the sun. And the splitting of atoms is altogether different from the incandescence of the lighting, which turns out to have nothing at all to do with the phosphorescence produced by chemicals in a firefly's tail. The only thing they have in common is they appear bright, otherwise they are not similar at all. It's all relative. If, as we make closer observations, fire vitalism and impetus were revealed not to be as we thought they were, does it mean there is no objective truth but just an endless regression of ideas? Kuhn suggested the answer was yes, as evidence he offered the work of Einstein. I do not doubt that Newton's mechanics improves on Aristotle's and that Einstein's improves on Newton's instruments for puzzle solving, but I can see in their succession no coherent direction of ontological development. On the contrary, in some important respects, though by no means at all, Einstein's general theory of relativity is closer to Aristotle's than either of them is to Newton's. This suggested that there was no real progress in science. It was simply a grand circle or an endless regression. But Kuhn's theory, while dramatic and captivating, was incorrect. Individual scientists like Harlow Shapley may fall off track and become overly invested in a priori Cartesian first principles and thus become blind to observational evidence, but overall scientific progress is real. It has political implications because new knowledge gives new power, but it is not merely a social exercise that relies on outliers changing the minds of the curmudgeonly majority or waiting for them to die off. There is an observable reality on which empirical science is based and from which knowledge is derived. That is why it has power. It enables us to affect the physical world in ways we couldn't before. The observations and knowledge extend incrementally by the contributions, risks, and suffering of many. They do not extend in sudden and dramatic paradigm shifts, and they didn't in Einstein's day either. In fact, many of the ideas Einstein developed were done collaboratively, with considerable debate, a prime example being the cosmological constant. 
His early papers were extensions of the work of Max Planck, the Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, and others, and his revolutionary findings on Brownian motion were independently discovered by Polish physicist Martin von Smolczowski, who was also building on Boltzmann's work. Hubble's revolutionary discovery of the expansion of the universe also extended from ideas that were talked about for years. The redshift was first noted by American astronomer Vesto Slafer in 1912, nearly two decades before Hubble's discovery. Galileo's revolution was an extension of Copernicus's writings of some 70 years before, which were widely discussed. The discovery of the double helix structure of DNA was revolutionary, but it too was an extension, building on the work of biochemist Erwin Shargaff. It is true that science does not proceed linearly. It proceeds more like a pack of dogs sniffing out a fox. But that is because of its trial and error observational approach that adopts whatever new tools become available, applies metaphor, builds on the latest recorded knowledge, the literature, as scientists call it, and makes and tests bold predictions to better see the reality of the thing instead of our prejudices or assumptions or beliefs or opinions or hopes and dreams. Science is our very best tool against prejudices and unexamined attitudes, not the cultural expression of them. The Age of Equality at the time, Kuhn's work seemed to offer a resounding refutation of the claims of the truth and power of science, and it serves as a catalyst, shifting the paradigm of America's entire relationship to science. If science was simply one way of knowing about the world, other previously discounted ways of knowing might be equally valid. This seemed obvious. The world wasn't mechanistic after all. We could throw out the past and take up whatever view of reality best suited us. We could be free. It was the dawning of the Age of Aquarius. In politics, this thinking became entwined with the goals of the civil rights movement, examination of power structures, discovery of voices not valued by history, cultural tolerance, acceptance of diverse viewpoints, affirmative action, mindfulness of the biases of the speaker, a pullback from Western exceptionalism and white supremacy, and a celebration of the self-evident truth that lies at the foundation of the nation, that all people are created equal. If science was the voice of Western white male culture, then it was not the voice of other discounted cultures. Academics, writers, politicians, and teachers, in a sort of intellectual affirmative action, took the idea to its logical conclusion. From all people being created equal to the notion that all cultures are created equal, and from that to the idea that all ideas are created equal. Suddenly, truth was a matter of your perspective. There was no objective truth. There was feminist truth, male truth, indigenous truth, African-American truth, Latino truth, GLBT truth, Islamic truth, working class truth, and so on, all of which had to be equally respected, and not just their contributory aspects, but in their entireties and without judgment. Thus, if someone from a disempowered political group did something morally reprehensible, he or she still had to be given extra understanding, because it was probably partly because of disenfranchisement. Cultural conservatives objected to this on a rationalist basis, and were crowded into the bottom right political quadrant with scientists who didn't belong there, but suddenly rationalism and modernism seemed like old and conservative ideas, expressions of authority. The political left lost many otherwise liberal thinkers who could not stomach elevating a political goal over the ideas of the region and enlightenment. Their opposition was often judged not on its intellectual merits, but through a political lens, and considered to be ignorant, racist, sexist, supremacist, ill-read, or right-wing. Vast, sweeping indictments of everyone who did not embrace the new politics, whether they actually were racist or simply rationalists. In fact, the postmodernists argued rationalism itself was part of the whole problem. What rationalists were unwilling to admit, they argued, was that irrational processes, not rational ones, lay at the core of Kuhn's revolutions in science. Rationalism itself was simply a thinly veneered tool of domination. Wolves in Sheep's Clothing Building on the work of Kuhn, whose manuscripts The Structure of Scientific Revolutions he had critiques in 1960, postmodernist Paul Feyerabend succinctly summed up the thinking. The world, including the world of science, is a complex and scattered entity that cannot be captured by theories and simple rules. There is not one common sense, there are many. Nor is there one way of knowing. Science, there are many such ways, and before they were ruined by Western civilization, they were effective in the sense that they kept people alive and made their existence comprehensible. The material benefits of science are not at all obvious. 
The year event had been widely quoted by anti-science postmodernists on the left, but also by anti-science religious authoritarians on the right. In 1990, the arch-conservative German Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was in charge of Roman Catholic doctrine. Ratzinger was a strict authoritarian who would eventually become Pope Benedict XVI, steering the church back into the political bottom wing. He gave a major speech in which he condoned the 1633 trial and conviction of Galileo for heresy, using a quote from Feyerabend to make his arguments. The church at the time of Galileo was much more faithful to reason than Galileo himself, and also took into consideration the ethical and social consequences of Galileo's doctrine. Its verdicts against Galileo was rational and just, and revisionism can be legitimized solely for motives of political opportunism. The End of Objectivity While such views remain contained within relatively limited intellectual and political groups, little attention was paid to them by the mainstream scientific community, reflects the editors of the science journal Nature in a 1997 opinion piece. But over the past few years, their influence has appeared to flourish not only in the academic world, including school teaching, but also in the wider community. The entire movement was tinkering with the foundations of democracy in ways few understood. By making objectivity supremacist, the subjectivism that America's founders had sought to free from, but had partially failed by accepting slaves and women from those created equal, was restored to the throne, and much of American education and thought after the 1970s lost its grip on reality and became embroiled in but faith or opinion, but not knowledge, in the words of John Locke. It was an unfair and vastly oversimplified criticism of science to say that because it was a field predominantly populated by white men, it was simply another subculture that was trying to retain its seat of power at the top of the heap. Many professional endeavors at the time were the field of white men. The thinking mistakenly focused on scientists as a group of some particular background rather than on science as a process of ideas, something people do, a cultural expression that, like art, cuts across all groups and is ultimately a method that works against prejudices to capture truth. In fact, it was the thinking of science itself that laid the very foundation for the values of tolerance and diversity used to sell postmodernism by originally advancing the idea that, based on our equivalent opportunities to observe reality and derive knowledge, all men and women are created equal. That this was not immediately achieved is to make the perfect the enemy of the good. None of it would have happened at all without the conceptual foundation which rests on the early Enlightenment thinking of science. As a foundation of democracy, science itself is a font of tolerance, and it is also the greatest beneficiary of diversity because it thrives on challenges from differing viewpoints to make its conclusions stronger. In the sense that it is now international, with scientists from around the world collaborating on research projects over the internet, sharing a common language of science, the global science enterprise is in many ways the most diverse and yet universal undertaking in human history. When viewed from this perspective, it is clear that if taken to an extreme, postmodernism can embroil society in the same sort of culture wars that roiled Europe at the beginning of the Enlightenment. These conflicts motivated Locke to seek ways to define what is universal and separate from denominational identity, knowledge, and inspired Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and others to found the United States on that bedrock. The culture wars the United States is currently experiencing are really one three-front anti-science war, a fundamentalist backlash against science, a propaganda war being waged by vested business interests, and an assault from postmodern identity politics that are based not on religious denomination but on gender, sexual orientation, race, etc., and are sacrosanct as religions, with their authority undebatable and any questioning akin to blasphemy. Similar to the denominational battles between Protestants and Catholics and among the various sects of Protestantism, today's secular denominations claim the authority of a truth no member of another denomination can know. Collapsing Hermeneutic Isolation, the Quantum Studies Approach to Politics by the 1990s, a full generation's worth of university departments had grown up around cultural studies, women's studies, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender studies, science studies, etc., all purporting to be among the social sciences, but arguing the a priori political notion misappropriated from quantum mechanics that objective reality is subject to the observer. Academics would often borrow the language of science in this way, though only when it supported their views, and use jargon to make sometimes outlandish political statements sound highbrow. In 1994, Rutgers University mathematician Norman Levitt and University of Virginia biologist Paul Gross 
published a polemic attacking the appropriation of scientific terminology called Higher Superstition, the Academic Left and its Quarrel with Science. Like Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, Higher Superstition charted a new course in the culture wars and became a bestseller. Gross and Levitt characterized the conflicts as a clash between the academic left and the scientific right, and academics called the book Right Wing. But there were plenty of scientists on the left and others who were ideologically unaffiliated who were tiring of the raging argument over the culture-centric and nature reality that by then was being called the science wars. Among the most notable was eminent Harvard University etymologist E. O. Wilson, who declared in a New Orleans speech that multiculturalism equals relativism equals no super collider equals communism. Then, in 1996, humanities scholar Andrew Ross, the editor of the leading postmodernist journal Social Text, made a fateful decision. He decided to devote an issue to discussion of the science wars and accepted for publication a paper by Alan Sokol, a New York University physicist and self-described leftist who had been inspired by higher superstition, to submit a paper called Transgressing the Boundaries toward a transformative hermeneutics of quantum gravity. The only problem was that the paper was a hoax, a parody mashup of the most ridiculous postmodernist writing the so-called could find, that appropriated the language of science to argue that there was no reality. It was the kind of politically correct, heavily jargonized, but intellectually vapid nonsense Woody Allen's Alvy Singer had famously called mental masturbation in the 1977 film Annie Hall. It was tailor-made to please its intended audience, complete with the popularly employed quotation marks around certain words to imply an inferior, so-called, status. Deep conceptual shifts within 20th century science have undermined this Cartesian Newtonian metaphysics. Revisionist studies in the history and philosophy of science have cast further doubt on its credibility. And most recently, feminist and post structuralist critiques have demystified the substantive contents of mainstream Western scientific practice, revealing the ideology of domination concealed behind the facade of objectivity. It has thus become increasingly apparent that physical reality, no less than social reality, is a to bottom a social and linguistic constructs, that scientific knowledge, far from being objective, reflects and encodes the dominant ideologies and power relations of the culture that produced it. That the truth claims of science are inherently theory-laden and self-referential, and consequently that the discourse of the scientific community, for all its undeniable value, cannot assert a privileged epistemological status with results to counter hegemonic narratives emanating from dissident or marginalized communities. Shortly after that, Sokal published an article in Lingua Franca, a sort of people magazine of the academic world that describes the hoax and how it showed postmodernists were incapable of distinguishing between a real argument and nonsense. What concerns me, he wrote, is the proliferation not just of nonsense and sloppy thinking per se, but of a particular kind of nonsense and sloppy thinking, one that denies the existence of objective realities. The worldwide media loved the story because of its quality of the emperor's new clothes. Pompous college professors being exposed as vacuous dupes as a narrative not without appeal. The right in particular, which had been railing for years against the political correctness that was coming out of these identity politics, saw it as a long-awaited skewering of the feeds uh, elitist academic who's above it all, as commentator Rush Limbaugh said of the postmodernist Stanley Fish, the publisher of Social Texts, a skewering that dismayed progressives. He, Sakal says we're epistemic relativists, complained Stanley Aronowitz, co-founder of Social Text, we're not. He got it wrong. One of the reasons he got it wrong is he's ill-read and half-educated. But this snobbish not in response only bolstered Sokal's and cultural conservatives' criticisms. Conservatives have argued that there is truth, or at least an approach to truth, and that scholars have a responsibility to pursue it, wrote Janie Scott in a New York Times article about the hoax, news of which spread worldwide. They have accused the academic left of debasing scholarship for political ends. But it wasn't just conservatives. In academic circles, the hoax also reinforced the view of traditionalists on the left, including several prominent feminists, that women's studies and science studies were so much nonsense. Prominent gender historian Ruth Rosen wrote in the Los Angeles Times, 
It took a New York University physicist named Alan Sokol to expose the unearned prestige that the academic emperors have heaped upon themselves. A self-described progressive and feminist, to which I can attest I helped with his expose, Sokol became fed up with certain trendy academic theorists who have created a mystique around the hardly new idea that truth is subjective and that objective reality is fundamentally unknowable. To Sokal, the denial of known reality seems destructive of progressive goals. Michael Berube, a Pennsylvania State University literature professor and one of Sokal's most vocal critics, wrote an apology on mea culpa in 2011 describing how the hoax gave ammunition to the right but also to a previously silent group on the left who believes that class oppression was the most important game in town and that all this faddish talk of gender and race and sexuality was a distraction from the real struggle which had to do with capital and labor. Most important, the paper that punked, as Berube called it, social text, exposed the erosion of the standing of reason in American schools and universities, the educators of the next generation of leaders. This diminution has since proved problematic for democracy in a time when it is more important than ever to ground arguments and facts instead of facsimile bullshit that has the appearance of fact. What resulted was a pseudo-politics in which everything is claimed in the name of revolution and democracy and equality and anti-authoritarianism, and nothing is risked, wrote feminist essayist Katha Pollitt in The Nation. Postmodernism and the Anti-Science Right Most of today's journalists and policymakers did not come up through the sciences and were exposed in high school and college to the political correctness of postmodernists who populated humanities, education, and political science departments. Conservative students and those who would eventually become conservative did not forget the arguments they learned there, that science was just another way of knowing, and that people in authority could get away with passing off bullshit as truth, as long as their arguments sounded credible and included cherry-picked bits and pieces of science. This cynical doublespeak seemed to confirm the idea that was at the very heart of what would become the neoconservative movements. The winners write the history books. These guys were the living proof. They could even, as these professors had for close to a generation, successfully attack the credibility of science and reason itself, on which the secular world order was based, by casting it as just another world view. It is perhaps no coincidence that as these very students have assumed power as senior journalists in the media and policymakers in Congress and other elected offices, democratic society has been swept into an era of endless rhetorical debates over faith and opinion and of national discussions dominated by identity politics and partisanship, an intellectual morass justified as the marketplace of ideas. Thus, Wall Street can build a multi-trillion dollar edifice on worthless paper and the opinions of the economic seers at Harvard who pronounce it good with a few formulas and a heaping helping of intimidating and often nonsensical jargon. The major media outlets can give equal platforms to scientific outlets and celebrities on important scientific issues ranging from climate change to vaccines and autism. It's not their role to establish the objective truth of the matter, some leading members of the press argue, any more than it was to question the lack of a substantive rationale for going into Iraq. The times, we're told, are new. The old rules no longer apply. We must be open to new things, to hearing new voices. We must not pass judgments. The teachers must learn from the students. Science has proven by its results that this is wrong. There is objective truth to be learned by observation, and the knowledge gained gives power that other ways of knowing have not. But the more dangerous problem with postmodernist thinking is its a priori nature. Not truth, but a political goal has to be served. In this particular case, the goal of openness or tolerance without judgment. But without acknowledging objective truth, all arguments become rhetorical and therefore can go on forever. We are either paralyzed by it or we must resort to authority instead of objectivity to make decisions, which collapses us all the way back to Thomas Hobbes' war of every man against every man, pre-democracy, pre-enlightenment. Thus, when taken to an extreme, postmodernist thinking inevitably leads through its dependence on authority to the brutality it sought to avoid, a brutality that was becoming increasingly evident in political arguments as the later baby boomers took charge in culture. As the first children taught under this philosophy, they were generally unable to articulate positions based on accumulated knowledge or data because they hadn't been taught about them or taught to value them, and so were left with but faith or opinion and a belief that what matters most is finding the nuggets that match your arguments and in never ever compromising because the winner writes the history books. 
Physicist Lawrence Krauss, a co-founder of the science debate effort, wrote presciently of the political ramifications for the country in a 1996 New York Times opinion piece in which he describes how presidential candidate Pat Buchanan had recently professed that he was a creationist. Although journalists questioned other Buchanan campaign planks like trade protectionism and limits on immigration, Krauss said there were no major articles or editorials declaring the candidates' views on evolution to be nonsense. Why is this the case? Could it be that the fallacies inherent in a strict creationist viewpoint are so self-evident that they were deemed not to deserve comment? I think not. Indeed, when a serious candidate for the highest offices of the most powerful nation on earth holds such views, you would think that this commentary would automatically become newsworthy. Rather, what seems to have taken hold is a growing hesitancy among both journalists and scholars to state openly that some viewpoints are not subject to debate. They are simply wrong. They might point out flaws, but journalists also feel great pressure to report on both sides of a debate. This erosion of our capacity to simply tell the truth began to have profound effects that aided and abetted the rise of the anti-science right. These effects would only become clear to postmodernists later when the anti-science right repurposed postmodernist arguments to make the case that climate science is not objective, but rather subjective and politically suspects junk science, the products of a culture of corruption by an environmental priesthood of scientists intent on world domination. Today's serious candidates for Congress and the presidency can openly state views that run counter to all known science and history, and many journalists don't feel it is their role to point out that the emperor has no clothes. The dissociation from history and the hard-won knowledge of science and the classical humanities has thus led to a generation of leaders that are at once arrogant and ignorant, and may be unable to lead the nation out of the morass because we have nothing solid to build upon. We have little foundation outside of the immediate concerns of politics and pragmatism and our own feelings. We embrace the forms of tradition but not the substance, focused only on winning, unable to discern between what feels good and what is true. It is a condition that threatens to leave the country permanently damaged. New Age Anti-Science Emerging from the ideas of postmodernism was its cousin, the New Age, a pop culture spiritual movement built on postmodernist ideas. Traditional religions rejected this notion, and so in many ways the New Age became the religious aspects of the secular postmodern movement. Much of its early formation can be traced to the writings of novelist and poet Jane Roberts, who, in 1963, the year after Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions became a massive bestseller, began channeling the words of a disembodied spirit named Seth. In 1970, Roberts published the Seth material, closely followed by Seth Speaks the Eternal Validity of the Soul in 1972. The books became mega bestsellers are in some ways similar to Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra and that Seth argues there is a higher self, a sort of ubermensch driver of the vehicle that is your mind and body, and to the postmodernist view that we create our own reality, which became the foundation concept of the New Age. Over the course of the 1970s, the New Age exploded as a spiritual movement, gentrifying a collection of ideas and practices culled from non-Western and indigenous previously discounted religions. New Age retreats, which at the time were attended most exclusively by white middle-class people, featured psychic readings by clairvoyants, spiritual lectures by trans mediums like Roberts, aura readings, laying on of hands, homeopathy, extrasensory perception, Reiki healing, a course in miracles, hypnosis and paths to life, regression, transcendental meditation, Uri Geller and spoon bending, telekinesis, psychokinesis, remote viewing, astral projection, sweat lodges, vision quests, psychic channeling, the I Ching, the Kama Sutra, the Tao Te Ching, Bach Flower Remedies, Jungian Dream Analysis, Reincarnation Astrology, the Edgar Casey Recordings, Tarot Readings, The Existence of Atlantis, Chakra Adjustment, Crystal Healing, UFOs, Automatic Writing, Spirit Guides, Ouija Boards, Biofeedback, Consciousness Raising, Yoga, and Chanting the Word Om, which is said to contain all the sounds in the universe. In short order, the movement became big business. The retreats became like carnivals. They were held around the country and included workshops put on by New Age teachers and featured big-name keynote speakers who were revered like holy gurus. A flood of bestsellers followed, creating the New Age genre. Jonathan Livingston Siegel, Illusions, Remember, Be Here Now, The Dancing We Lou Masters, The Teachings of Don Juan, Handbooks to Higher Consciousness, The Hundredth Monkey, Love is Letting Go of Fear, The Crack in the Cosmic Eggs, A Course in Miracles, Your Erroneous Zones, and The Aquarian Conspiracy, each purporting to peel away the 
gauze and reveal the true underlying and magical nature of a reality that you could create simply by believing it was so. If all ways of knowing are equal, then homeopathy, in which a substance that would create the patient's symptoms in the healthy person is successfully diluted until none of its molecules remain, the more dilute, the greater the supposed potencies administered as a cure, should be as efficacious as conventional pharmaceutical treatments by anyone who values open-mindedness. Anyone who challenges the idea is just a skeptic, the New Age version of a spiritual bigot who is trying to oppress holistic higher thinking because of his or her paradigm of Western white supremacy. Philosophy professor Theodore Schick Jr. and Louis Vaughn, once the managing editor of Prevention Magazine, have written extensively and critically about the spiritual version of postmodern anti-science. They summarized how New Age thinking plays out through popular culture in their book, How to Think About Weird Things, Critical Thinking for a New Age. There is no such thing as objective truth. We make our own truth. There is no such thing as objective reality. We make our own reality. There are spiritual, mystical, or inner ways of knowing that are superior to our ordinary ways of knowing. If an experience seems real, it is real. If an idea feels right to you, it is right. We are incapable of acquiring knowledge of the true nature of reality. Science itself is irrational or mystical. It's just another faith or belief system or myth, with no more justification than any other. It doesn't matter whether beliefs are true or not, as long as they're meaningful to you. Thus, Reiki healing may offer as much hope as chemotherapy, and if it fails, it is because the patient is blocked, unable to accept the healing energy, unable to let go of anger from past life or what have you, and so the fatal illness progresses. It's his or her own faults. The reasons for failure are emotional and spiritual and have nothing to do with the practitioner or the method or the physical world. But like other a priori approaches, such as religion and postmodernism, the New Age lacks a method of establishing knowledge independent of the authority of the practitioner. It thus requires faith in the guru, faith in the invisible, faith in the energy, trust the force, Luke. This road is appealing because it offers ready access to mystery and hope, exactly the fare that science once sold to the public. It is non-judgmental and welcoming precisely because all judgment must be suspended. But in the end, without objective standards, it must fall back on authority as the arbiter of what is true. And so it too ultimately leads back to brutality. The brutality of the blame the victim aspects of New Age thinking is on ready display when the patient fails to be healed. This is a common scenario in New Age healing classes, which often draw desperate people with illnesses for which medical science has not yet been able to affect cures. For admission, they pay hundreds or thousands of dollars, hoping to be healed. The healer who claims to be tuned into the energy of the universe and his or her higher self in a very powerful and open channeler lays on hands and may get other students in the groups to channel their higher energy as well. Only the poor patient is blocked. The rest, these very special students, can see it clearly by clairvoyantly looking at the blackness in his aura and feeling the coldness in the parts of the aura affected by the disease. This block is likely the fault of some anger or other negativity he is holding on to. Because we manifest our own reality, physical maladies are usually the symptoms of deeper spiritual causes. It may even be something he is not aware of from a past life, but it is why he is sick. If only he could see the truth of this and face himself, he could stop refusing the healer's loving energy and be healed. But alas, he cannot. We can all see it. Why can't he? It's not that the coarseness of this thinking is intentional. Many New Agers have the best of intentions. After all, they embrace tolerance and openness. But when confuted by reality, for example, by the deterioration and death of a well-adjusted and otherwise spiritually innocent patient, they have nothing to fall back on because none of this thinking is based in reality, so they are forced to either reject New Age principles or become intellectually dishonest. Rejecting both a belief system and a warm and embracing but very political community is a hard thing to do, just ask Thomas Kuhn. It is what he argued scientists are unable to easily do. A paradigm change like this comes at great cost to one's vested interests, be they social, emotional, financial, or political. But in refusing to accept subjective truth and the possible pain of intellectual honesty, one is left with the heartlessness of hubris, false hope, and blame. If we are unwilling to let go of our a priori principles and muster the courage to look at the situation as it is, that good people sometimes become sick and die through no faults of their own, rather than as we wish it would be, we 
If we insist on harboring science as, as one would, as Bacon called it, colored by our feelings, then it must be the other that is wrong. Thus Shapley wipes Humison's photographic plate clean. Disease victims are at fault and die due to their own bottled up anger or other spiritual shortcomings. And the Emperor's tailor is celebrated and paid a fortune from the people's hard earned stores for his most beautiful weave, as many New Age gurus are. It is a retreat into superstition and darkness with heartbreaking human consequences, and even more heartbreaking political ones, rendered under the auspices of openness, tolerance, and love. Well, that is finally the end of Chapter 7. Thankfully, Chapter 8 isn't quite as long, and that is the Descent of Thought, which we will get into next week. Thanks for watching.